Hello, everybody. My name is Scott Gladstone. I'm the graduate assistant of sports information and game management at North Park University. And we're doing another version of the uh, CCIW Decade Series, which is featuring um, a, an athlete from every school uh, member institution in the CCIW um, at, at, that featured in each one of the nine decades that the CCIW has been, ar been around. Uh, for North Park, we got the 2010s, and, uh, and I'm uh, really excited to be joined by Nick Saldano, uh, who was a left-handed pitcher for the North Park baseball team uh, from 2010 to 2014. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Nick, for, uh, for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's start off with just, just even before you got to college, when, when, was, uh, when was the first time you – you picked up a baseball, started playing baseball seriously, and uh, and when did you realize, you know, that baseball was going to be a sport that you were going to pursue collegiately? Yeah, so um, I don't know the exact age of, of me picking up a baseball. I think it was just kind of in my blood from the get-go. My dad was a good ball player, kind of known around the county, um, and I've always just been been ready to go with baseball, so it was kind of my, my first love there, and, um, you know, when it came, there was no real plan B when it came to, to baseball. It was get drafted, have a good time, make a bunch of money, and try to be the best that I can be. So, um, you know, having that goal in mind from from day one was, was always crucial for me. Um, but when I first figured out that I was going to be as good as I was, was – you know, probably when I just started getting college attention, you know, you, you don't really realize it. I come from a, a bigger part of town, but not really known for their baseball. So you didn't see many scouts around and we weren't very good in high school. I think we had about four wins in four years. So um, not many college recruits were coming to those games. So um, had a bunch of phone calls, thought it would be realistic and, and just kind of took it from, from there. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so you, you get, called up by North Park at, at some point and uh, and how, how did that recruiting process work for you how'd you how'd you end up at, at, at North Park so it was really interesting I had a couple of, of opportunities to walk on um, at some other places but it just it didn't feel right to me um, and then I remember my on-site vision uh, visit with LJ and it was almost like he's he's known me for for decades I mean if you've ever met the guy he's he's your best friend from day one so I knew from, from that point on when we sat down in the, the uh, little place in Hellwig and we had the conversation of this is where you're at now, this is where you can be in four years from now if you work your hardest and you bust your butt. Um, and it sold me almost immediately. I was like, where do I sign? You know, I know it's a private liberal arts school. Don't care how much it costs. Dad, sign the contract and let's get this thing going. So um, it, was, it was immediate love from day one. Um and then, then you, of course, show up on campus. And uh, what, what were the first kind of impressions that you had when you showed up on campus? Uh, of course, there's so much transition when you show up to college in general, yeah. even not as a student athlete. Um, but, but how was your kind of initiation into the, into the baseball program and, and into school at North Park? Yeah, so that first week, that initiation week or, or welcome week, as they call it, um, you kind of black out a little bit, if I'm being honest. Like, you just don't really know where to go. You're like a chicken with its head cut off. I want to see everything. I don't want to see everything. So you kind of make friends. Um, and then obviously with the baseball relationship, you know you're on the team. You kind of weed out with people in the other teams. So obviously got my, uh, my tight niche of freshmen that I hung out with. Obviously one of them being a catcher, you just kind of got to do it. Um, and, you know, it was, it was kind of just blissful at that point, to say the least. You know, you're away from your parents for a while. You don't really got to be told what to do. You got LJ on your back, but, you know, you're still having a good time. You're, you're really enjoying it. Yeah, and, and then eventually, um, which, you know, it's kind of the – maybe it's a good thing about being a spring sport or maybe, maybe it's not. You eventually, you know, got on the field and, and got to play. And uh, you had, I, I think, in terms, of, in terms of a freshman season, a really successful one. Um, but but you you didn't start a game your freshman season right. uh, but 13 appearances um, and uh, and you know a relatively good season and, and and the same thing with your sophomore year when you seem to start it, starting to get in, uh, started to get known as a starter um, you started six games that year um, 
what what were your real like concentrations? What were you trying to focus on in, in those early um, in those early seasons uh, when you you knew you were transitioning to become um, right. one of the aces for the North Park program? Yeah, so I guess the best way to answer that is I've learned a lot um, from our leadership. You know, you had guys ahead of me, Tito Garza, Mike Giovanco, which is a Hall of Famer, Zach Deutscher, which should be a Hall of Famer, Nick Marino, all those guys, Angel Carrasco, you know, they, they instilled a work ethic in us that still kind of transitions into to life today. You know, if you did it, if you slacked off 1% from the day before, you're, you're getting your head ripped off by those guys because they knew that it was perfection and that was kind of it. And I came in a very, very lightweight individual. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm tall, but back in the day, I was 155 pounds. You know, and I walk into the gym and I see, you know, people like Mike Giovanco squatting 400 pounds. I'm like, I'm, I'm never going to play. So it was, it was more of that first year, just trying to figure it out, right? Just trying to figure out how to actually pitch at the collegiate level, try to figure out the work ethic and obviously trying to figure out the, the work-life balance as well, right? With school and you got athletics and North Park's very demanding on our baseball program of you put in the time both in the classroom and in, in the gym. So, you know, it was, it was a transition. You kind of just fill in where you can and help where you can. So, you know, you just got to come to the, the field every day and work hard and hopefully something happens and you get an opportunity, you better take advantage of it. Yeah. And, and the end of your, your sophomore year there in 2011, I mean, it was a really successful year for the team. You guys had a lot of talent, um, but you go 0 and 2, I believe in the conference tournament and, yeah. uh, and go out right away. Uh, how much of an impact did that have uh, of having that really disappointing end of the season to what happened with the team in 2012? Yeah. So it was, it was kind of a trickle down or actually just, it was kind of a build up from there, you know, even our freshman year in the tournament, you know, we, we ended up getting knocked out by the, the national champs, Illinois Wesleyan, and that pissed us off. Um, and that instilled some more work ethic for us my sophomore year. And, and you know, sophomore year, honestly, you know, we just, we ran out of gas and that was really it. And, we were not conditioned for, for that kind of season. Um, so we took that summer, we just absolutely busted our butts. We had guys go to some very, very good summer ball teams, you know, Steve Kuligowski being one, we, we spent a summer together. So it wasn't just getting on the field a lot more and getting that conditioning to go a little bit longer seasons, but it was, you know, we were a pretty tight knit family after that sophomore year. And we continued that culture into junior year. And, and you know, you can kind of obviously, see that for yourself in the, in the stats, but um, it was, it was all hands on deck that year. We were, we were going balls out. Yeah. And then uh, of course you had that 2012 year. It was an incredibly successful year for the team. Uh, let me just pull it up right here. 32 and 14 overall, you guys won the conference tournament. Uh, you, you had uh, a berth in the national tournament. Uh, and then for you individually, um, that's when you won co-pitcher of the year for the CCIW. Um, you were all region for multiple uh, organizations. Uh, you were the D3 Central Region Pitcher of the Year, D D3 Baseball Central Region Pitcher of the Year, um, 3 one two ERA, 9-2 and two overall, which I'm pretty sure that win percentage is right near the top uh, of North Park's all-time record book, and 101 innings pitch, which just kind of blows my mind, uh, as well as 99 strikeouts, which is the second most in a single season in North Park history. Uh, what what worked for you personally? Let, let's start with you personally that season where you just caught, caught, caught absolute fire. Yeah, so it was it was the coaching staff, you know, and, you know, every average person is going to say, well, I worked hard and, and that's kind of what it was. But honestly, if, if my if our coaching staff wasn't pushing me along the way and kind of set me up for for success like that, you know, I can only tell how far I can go. But when other people see that vision for you it's a, an extra road, extra motivator. So, you know, there were times where I was throwing complete games early on in the year and, you know, I'm running hour, hour and a half the day after, you know, blacking out, puking, you know, it was just a, a crazy conditioning schedule for us. And I was, you know, and every player is going to be like, what the heck am I doing here? You know, run like this isn't a cross country team. Um, but they just push you to a level that you can't necessarily understand until you're there. And then you start to see that vision, you see that progression, you see those results. And not only that, but, you know, 
every time a ball was in play, I knew the ball was either going to be caught or there was not going to be made. We had a great middle infield. We had a great first base and we had a stellar outfield. You know, I can't even tell you how many web gems we had in Florida, you know, early on in the year. So having that trust with those guys was, was ultimately, you know, a huge success for me, obviously, because I can go out on the field and know that I don't have to strike everybody out. You know, I can go there, I can force ground balls, I can get guys to turn to, I can get, you know, balls in the gap, get caught. So, you know, all the success is, is definitely to my defense, for sure. Yeah, and you, you mentioned a couple of questions ago. You mentioned Steve Kuligowski and, uh, and I mean, just the one-two punch you guys uh, must have been that season. And every team that knew they were in a series against you guys knew it's, it's going to be uh, two games where at least their pitchers are going to have to to pitch lights out just to stay in the game um, with, with the way you guys pitched that season. Because not only were you – in that season atop a lot of the North Park single season record books uh, right next to you with Steve Kuligowski in almost all those categories. Um, and it, what can you say about that dynamic and, and your dynamic with the rest, rest of the pitching staff that, that really uh, created that success for that season? Yeah, Steve was a workhorse, man. It, uh, it was fun watching him. You know, the second guy out usually has to do the chart. We always hated doing the chart, but he just made it so easy. You know, it was fastball change up all day. Guys were fishing at things and he just made everyone look so uncomfortable and he was so calm and collect on the mound. You know, that's somebody that I like to look up to. Um, someone who can have bases loaded bottom of the ninth, you're on the mound, you need to make a strike here. He's making that strike. Whether or not I want to trust myself in making that play, he's 100% making that play. And the good thing about me going second out, you know, he was our number one guy. I was our number two at the time and it just played out because – you know, I'd watch him pitch. I'd watch every single detail, every minute detail that he had. And I'd want to one-up him every time, you know, and not only on the field, but in the weight room, on the field doing conditioning. He always beat me in conditioning. He'll tell you that until the day he dies. Um, but we were just a really high energy, competitive group of people, you know, and that's not just to say Steve and I, but every single one on the pitching staff, we were always trying to beat each other in something, whether that's running back to the locker room, first one at practice, throwing the ball as far as we can on the football field. It was just always com competition with us. So I think that, that that's a big reason why we were so successful, not just me and Steve, but as a pitching staff as well. I mean, we had a really good stat line that year too. Yeah, and, uh, and of course, there's all that success from that season, all that momentum that you're bringing into the next year. And anybody who's an athlete knows that um, it, it's, it's always a roller coaster. And of course, you get injured that next season. Um, take us back to when you, when you got hurt, um, did you know immediately that your season was going to be done or, uh, or how, how did that come about? Um, that, that really, you know, your, your, your injury and the end of your, um, what was at the time your, your senior season there? Yeah. So injury came very odd. Um, you know, we were just playing normal catch warming up and, and felt it didn't feel like a pop. Didn't really feel like anything. You don't really process it at the time. And, it was actually bullpen day for me. So I'm, I'm on the mound after I pop this thing and I can't even like, I'm bouncing balls off the plate fastballs. And I'm like, well, this isn't good. So um, our pitching coach at the time, uh, coach Thomas Shadditz, he goes, well, your arms just tired. Go for a run. So I ran for like the next hour and 15 minutes across campus trying to flush this thing out. And it just, it didn't work. So um, we didn't really know what it was. I know that I had pitched 101 innings before that summer ball. I, I pitched quite a bit as well. It was, it was essentially my very first quote unquote major league innings season. Right. So um, we just thought it was my arm just started to get dead or started to get tired. So we did a lot of rehab for that week and I ended up starting um, that game that following week. So that was, that happened on a Tuesday. It was my bullpen day always on Tuesday. And then I ended up starting on Friday um, ended up starting really good. You know, velocity was not down at all. And then all of a sudden third, fourth inning or whatever the case may be, ball was just not getting over the plate. So again, it's, it's one of those things where it's, you're not really thinking, okay, I've got a full blown torn UCL here. You know, you think it's just your muscles just tired, your arm just tired, got to run it off and, and get going again until you go to the doctor and they say, yeah, no, this is your, your elbow exploded. So, um, at that point, again, you, you don't really process it until the doctor and your head coach sit you down and say, you're done for the season. And you're like, no, no, it, we'll be fine. You know, we've had multiple arguments. I've had 
a dozen of arguments with LJ saying, no, 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 tape it up. I'll pitch. We'll be fine. We'll be good. Um, you don't really want to let your team down. You feel like you're letting your team down when you get hurt. And it's just not one of those things that I like hearing about. So um, it was, uh, it was kind of a slap in the head there for a second, but we all got over it. The guys rallied around me as well. Cause obviously that's a huge emotional roller coaster that you got to go through. And you know, it, it ended up just being what it was and you just got to take it with, with what that card was. Yeah. And then, and then you, you end up being able to come back for one more season. And uh, I mean, the way, the way that I like, you know, when I was looking at the stats and, and looking at the story of your career um, and, and of course I broadcasted all the baseball, all the home games for North Park this season. And a, a big storyline this season was last season for a lot of these seniors getting it cut short because of COVID um, yeah. when, you know, Obviously, it was different, but kind of a similar situation where um, you had that season taken away from you, and uh, and there was a lot of these seniors on this year's team that that came back for for uh, you know this one last ride and feeling like their their work wasn't done. So um, how how did that that um, chance to come back and uh, and have a really um, really effective senior season? How did that all come about for you? Yeah, so I was hungry, man. I was really hungry to get back. Um, I didn't want to end it the way that it ended. Um, and obviously we got kicked out of the tournament that year as well. We just had some pretty low morale. So I wanted to get back and, and kind of prove dominance again, you know, go back to the old North park way where it's a uh, shoot, we got to play North park again. Here's, here's at least two losses on our schedule. Um, and so that was just my made of main drive is, you know, let's, let's get back to that. And I went into rehab. I was doing rehab four times or four hours a day. I was doing my runs. I was trying to stay in shape and, you know, ultimately, you know, it obviously happened again, but, you know, we had a really good year going up to the conference tournament. You know, we were, we were neck and neck with a lot of the top teams in the, in the country and in the conference. And, you know, we had a lot of good momentum going forward, but, you know, again, physics always, uh, always wins in, in that regard. Yeah. Um, but on that, that coming down the stretch in the, in that final year, um, what what was your mentality? I mean, I mean, you mentioned you were hungry, but when you knew, okay, you know, I, I don't. Th these are going to be probably my final baseball games uh, yeah. coming down the stretch. There, H how was the feeling for you, especially knowing that your season before ended with the injury, and there was probably a moment when you didn't know if you were going to play again. H how how was your mentality throughout that final year, but especially coming down the stretch? You know, I just wanted to keep a pedal to the metal the entire time whatever happens is going to happen but if if I get hurt going 90 percent I'm never going to forgive myself so um you know I I was kind of a, a glass house you know and, and my bones were made of glass at that point I can't tell you how much tape I had on my body that fifth year you know I had two taped ankles too so it was you know I wasn't going out without a fight and I think that a lot of the guys followed that and saw that and, and kind of took that with what it was and, and knew that, you know, if I'm going to get beat, I'm going to get beat with my best stuff, whether that's at practice or at the game. So, you know, the, men, the mindset was don't lose, obviously don't ever lose, but if you have to go out with your best stuff and, and the way that it turned out, fortunately, I didn't lose much either my fifth year, but um, yeah, it's just go go all out. I mean, what else do you have to lose at that point, except for going full blow the entire time? Yeah. And then of course your career ended. Um, you got in, into coaching, correct? Afterwards? I did. Yep. Uh, so how did that transition come about? Did, did you know as soon as you graduated that you wanted to, to become a coach or, or did that, did it come about in a, in a more weird way? <sighs> So it was so weird, man. So originally, you know, obviously my, my goal was to still draft, get into the draft, don't care how low I'm going to go, I'm going to prove myself. And that was pretty realistic my senior, my first senior year. And then after the second tear, I was like, okay, screw it. You know, this isn't obviously going to happen anymore. Um, but at that point, I couldn't let go of baseball. You know, it was still in my blood. It was still kind of the thing. It was what I needed to do. Um, but I didn't know how to do it. I couldn't just be like, hey, I'm going to be an assistant coach now because that's not how that works, right? So fortunate for me um, was just browsing a lot of the coaching sites, saw that Heidelberg University needed a new GA and um, paying for school and all that fun stuff. And I knew that 
historically, they were a very, very good program over the last 10 years. I mean, you can see that on the stat line, even as of recent two years ago, almost winning a national championship again. So I knew I wanted to be a part of that success. I wanted that taste, right? I wanted to get into a regional and win some regional games and, and hopefully win a national tournament, whether that's as a coach or as a player. And it just so happened I didn't have much eligibility left to be a player. So I needed to, uh, to try it another way. And Heidelberg was the place to be. And it was an amazing experience. I loved it to death. I wouldn't regret any single day that I had there. Um, and yeah, it was just, a, it was an amazing experience with some great group of guys. And for you, especially, you know, playing five years of college baseball, um, what was the biggest transition for you from, um, from player to coach? Uh, what, what was the biggest thing that you were trying to kind of wrap, wrap your head around, I guess, as you transitioned into, you know, an authority figure? I guess. So hearing other people's philosophies, honestly, you know, why, why is someone doing – this way versus that way and I was always a you know listen to the coach he's always going to have the best thing in mind for you and you know when you get a little back talk back especially when you're a GA you're you're as old as a lot of these senior guys and um, you don't really know how to to communicate in that regard sometimes and it's a big barrier that you really have to overcome and so you know, the, I think the biggest transition is not everyone's built the same you got to coach every single player on your team differently and for me, I thought it was always, you know, this is what we're going to do today. This is kind of the cookie cutter system. And, and this is how we're going to do it um, until, you know, the first month in, you know, Chad Fitzgerald, the head coach, still is the head coach today. He goes, hey, we got to you got to adjust your plans here for, for every single player. I'm like, well, what do you mean? You know, I, this is the program. Like, this is what we do. He goes, no, no, no that's not how that works. You know, it might have worked for you guys, but that's not how it works with everyone. So you know, having a tailored approach to every single player, making sure that you're on top of every single player's mechanics, how they throw, why they throw, what they throw. It's, it's, it's mentally exhausting, but it's, it's fun to see that progression with those guys. Yeah. And so you continued coaching for, for a while and yeah. then, and you're out of coaching now, correct? I am out of coaching. Yep. So how was that transition? Um, because I, I mean, this is something, uh, you know, my boss, the SID at North Park, uh, Tyler Woolbright and I, we've talked about a lot where, um, you know, when, when you're an athlete, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of an addiction. And that, that's probably one of the reasons you got into coaching is because, um, you know, the highs of sports and the lows of sports, you just, you crave them. Um, and, uh, and I remember the first season, you know, I was out of my sport um, and sports, you know, you, you, feel, you feel a little bit empty. So yeah. how was that transition finally Finally, being out of sports, um, being out of coaching, out of baseball, uh, at least officially, um, how was that for you? It was tough. First couple months was really tough because you, you obviously want to track the guys that you've been coaching over the last couple of years. And Luther was really good to me in Iowa. Brian Nichols got a great program. It's just, you know, when, when Phoenix comes calling, you go. And I, my goal was always to get out of the Midwest. And, and Brian knew that. And, you know, Fortunate for me, I got out when there was a blizzard in Iowa. So, um, but no, it was, it was really tough. But the good thing about, you know, coming out here is there's baseball everywhere for me. Um, obviously, we're surrounded by baseball. We're surrounded by spring training complexes all over the place. So I've always loved the, the playing of baseball, but the analytics and the statistical, you know, mechanical, trying to break things down with, with the coaching side of things. It was fun and dandy, but I knew it wasn't really going to be my ultimate goal. Um, so I ended up going back and playing men's league baseball out here and, and just having a good time with it and just enjoying the game again, putting the cleats on and even get to hit. LJ didn't let me hit in college, so I got to, to live that fantasy again. So um, it, was, it was easier than what I thought it was going to be, definitely. Uh, but, yeah, it still was a mental struggle to be completely out of the game at that point. Yeah, and that, that's a good segue, and you, you kind of mentioned it, trying, trying to follow, you know, guys that you coached, and, and also you probably um, follow North Park as well, and, and uh, especially because your coach, Luke Johnson, is still, uh, is still the coach there, and, uh, and you know, Tyler is, is working there, and, uh, and, and so there's, there's all sorts of things. How, how do you um, keep up with, uh, you know, all, all the players you've coached, all the teams you've been with, uh, how, how do you do that? What's your, what's your kind of process to, to do that when it comes to uh, the, the hecticness of spring baseball? 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm a chatty Cathy, man. So if you get me on the phone, you better be ready to talk for at least 30 minutes. So um, I still keep up with a bunch of the guys that we played with. You know, Zach Worsley was a GA at North Park. He was the best man at my wedding. Tyler Wolbright, I call him every now and again. Haven't talked to him recently because the child and everything, letting him sleep when he can. But, um, no, it's a lot of the time now, obviously, I'm, I'm far removed from the program that I can't just text the players and be like, hey, you need to be better next week. Um, but back in the day, you know, two, three years removed, I knew a lot of those freshmen, obviously, um, would still text them every now and again, because we're all pretty close. I mean, we're all one tight knit family. So, you know, every now and again, LJ gets on a streak with North Park, keeps sending him texts, hey, keep it up, keep the momentum going. So I'm following as much as I can, obviously, day to day, pretty hectic, but, you know, religiously following the schedules as well. Yeah. Um... And how do you how do you stay connected with your teammates as well? Like, I mean, you, you mentioned phone, text. Um, how uh, luckily, I mean, this is the decade series, so I mean, yeah. it's interesting. Some some guys, you know, um, and like some interviewees are coming from the '50s and stuff like that. Obviously, you're the most modern. Uh, you're the newest interviewee. Um, so, how has is it, is it pretty easy to to keep up with? Uh, with all your teammates, especially, especially, you know, some of those years where you guys, you mentioned, especially that 2012 team going to the tournament, you guys really, really bonded and linked together, but, but all those teams, how, how easy is it to keep up with, even though now you're, you know, over five years kind of removed from, uh, from, from playing with everybody? Yeah. So it's, it's obviously a lot easier now than it was 10, 15, even 20 years ago, obviously, because we, you know, got the tech age here. So, you know, every form of social media I'm following these guys, you know, even Giovanco and Marino, I, I kind of know what they're doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm texting, I'm calling almost every single day. I'm, I'm calling one of the guys, um, whether we're playing phone tag or not, you know, and obviously texting everyone every, every single time of the day. Um, it's a little bit different now because we're so spread out in time zones. we got people in Illinois, we got people in California, we got people on the East coast. So got to transition that, but no, I mean, it's, you know, you're a family, you're kind of, you're kind of embedded in as a, as a blood brother in that sense. So you got to keep up with those guys because one of these days you're going to need them or they're going to need you. So um, you want to make sure that, that you've got their back and, and you know that, you know, vice versa. Uh, I always think starting pitchers are in a really unique scenario because you're not a day in day out player. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and obviously you had the injury as well that sidelined you. That was probably an interesting transition for you to be on the bench every single day. Um, but, but you were used to it in a way just because as a pitcher in general, you never know when you're going to get the call. And then when you're a starting pitcher, you know, okay, I get one out of every, you know, four games or whatever it is during the schedule. Um, how did you treat games when you when you weren't the starting pitcher when you were when you were on the sideline or in the dugout? Yeah, so a lot of the time because I was kind of the big mouth jokester, um, <laughs> I, the the pitching coach and you know Thomas Shevitz when he was our pitching coach, I was typically the one that was picked on to do the chart. And you know I'm going to attribute just because I'm a really good chart guy that I had to do that. So I, I kept busy with that, doing my research and, and doing this and doing that. But you know if you weren't finding me you know, doing the chart, I was yelling at someone in the other dugout. You know, I was, I was the big mouth. I was a loud mouth guy that you couldn't shut up, you know, but the funny thing was, is I didn't play like that. I was, I was a very quiet, cool, calm, collect player. So any chance or an opportunity that I got to crap talk and smack talk the other team, I was going to do it. And so I was, always I I had the biggest one of the biggest mouths on the team so if I wasn't saying something I was either sick or I was sleeping so you know you, you kind of just make the fun as it comes and uh on that note uh which was there any specific team especially in in conference play in the CCIW was there any team that 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 you really got up for that that um if you knew you were starting against them if you were playing again against them or even if you were in the dugout and the team was playing them that you were trying to get that little extra extra motivation uh from from the squad to, to go past was there any team that you kind of loved playing like that Carthage and Illinois Wesleyan, man, we hated them. We did, you know, they're, they're obviously both very, very talented. And we, we butt heads for that, that reason, you know, top teams tend to butt heads of the most. And, you know, when I was coming in at North Park, Carthage was kind of leading the pack at that point. And 
I know that the guys that we had traditionally hated Carthage and, you know, North Park and Carthage have that rivalry already, um, especially on the baseball side of things. So I loved when we played Carthage. Unfortunately, I didn't get to pitch with them or against them a lot, but when we were there or they were here, there was just a lot of trash talk back and forth. And every opportunity that we got to play Illinois Wesleyan, I, you know, I prayed that I started at Wesleyan on a Friday night. They, you know, arguably in the CCIW, they have one of the best playing environments just because they've got Greek life. You know, everyone's out on a Friday night letting loose and you get the lights on and it's dark out and kids start to come to the games. You're getting yelled at too. It's, it's very much a, an old summer ball environment there that you just love to be a part of. So, so that in my next question, other than maybe playing at home, uh, was, that, was that your favorite place to play, at least in the yeah. CCIW? Yeah, Wesleyan's got my heart, man. You know, that, that's the best place to play. They got the best fans to trash talk. Yeah, they're always talking trash. Um, you know, they got frat houses in right field. They've got a frat house behind third base. So, you know, they're, they're getting after you. They're getting after you quite a bit. So you got to be on your game. But it's, uh, it's the environment that I just thrived in. I loved it. Uh, we, we've mentioned, uh, you know, uh, I've mentioned throughout this, all, all the different big milestones and moments throughout your career. Um, you've received a ton of awards. You are a top, pretty much, I mean, in the top five on all the career record books. And you're, at least right now, the, the leading um, strikeout, uh, the, whole, the most ever strikeouts in NPU history. Um, but out of all those moments, out of all those strikeouts, all the wins, uh, what, what was, if you had to stable it down, the best moment of, of your North Park career? Man, Ryan Javik's walk-off against North Central at home. I mean, the photo speaks for itself. You can probably see it on, on all those guys um, that were a part of that team. They've got it on their Facebook anywhere. You know, it was just an amazing moment as just a program. You know, you, we got over a barrier that we hadn't overcome in a very long time. I think 94, 95, I think was the last time we won that regular season. Um, and for, you know, one of the guys coming back from an injury that year, Ryan Javik, to come up and have a walk-off hit and we dogpiled him in shallow right field was just you know a blissful moment you just you'll never forget that pile at all um f finally i mean we're coming down down to the end um but these are definitely kind of more general questions i guess but sure. um you, we, you mentioned kind of the injury and coming back from that and and, and other things but what do you think i've are the biggest lessons that you learned from, from your, your entire baseball career that, that you've taken with you even, even now uh, when you're in a career outside of baseball? You know, trust your teammates, number one. That's, that's obviously, you know, the biggest thing because you're not going to go into this world alone. You're really not. Whether that's in a work setting, hopefully you find a, a husband or a wife, whatever the case may be, you know, you're, you're going to travel this journey with somebody. So, Having 100% trust in that person, I would say, whether that be on a baseball field or in actual life, would probably be the number one. And number two is don't ever settle for anything. You know, go to bed every single night, look yourself in the mirror saying you gave 100% that day. And that's something that, you know, LJ and, and Coach Tomaszewicz and, and all the other coaches that I've, I've come across, that's, that's the biggest lesson that they've taught me. If you can't look yourself in the, in the mirror every single night, and say that you gave that day everything that you had, then it just wasn't successful for you. Um, and, and I transitioned to that because I'm, I'm, I'm in a career now where, you know, I make my own money, right? I, 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 my financial income comes from the efforts that I put in to it. And if you're not going 100%, then you're just going to get eaten alive. And that, you know, I attribute the CCIW to that. If you lose one game, you might be out of the running for the whole term. So, you know, if you're not trusting the process, trusting the system, and then trusting the people in front of you and behind you, you're not going to be very good. So you, you really need to just buckle down, open the barriers a little bit, trust that process, trust those people that are in front of you, and just go for it. I mean, what again, what else do you have to lose? And finally, last question here. If, you know, if you're talking to an 18-year-old, 17-year-old kid, maybe a pitcher, um, that's looking at playing in the CCIW, playing in Division Three, playing at North Park. What, what's the, the biggest piece of advice um, that you would give to them um, going forward and going into college? 
don't jog, sprint. You know, you especially with LJ, if anyone likes LJ, you know, you'll you'll go into his office, you'll see the four-time hustler award when he was at Elmhurst. He probably still gives that stupid speech. So he doesn't like people that jog around. He likes people that run. He likes people that throw hard, even if they're a 74 to 75 guy. Just put in the effort, you know, put your head down in the classroom. That's no number one thing for him. You know, if you know, he's going to promise you a good education. You just have to be able to get that education. So um, go in the classroom. Don't have a sick day. Don't make excuses because if you make an excuse with LJ, he's going to make you run for it. So, you know, just go all on. You know, if you're going to commit to something, commit to it 100%. And that's what LJ is looking for. And, you know, North Park's not cheap. It's a private liberal arts school. So you're already paying the money up front. You might as well get your money's worth, right? So go for it because if not, you're going to regret it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And well. uh, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely.